Flow of Physics 30s. I actually wanted to uh, cover just the principles of graphing here. So I put posted these notes. These are from uh, Brent Clintberg on studyphysics.ca. Uh, they were really just a good compression. So um, this is literally how Max Planck came up with Planck's constant. Um, what he did is he graphed, and this is the setup here, you graph energy on the y-axis and be prepared for occasionally the energy can be in electron volts instead of in joules, but it's energy. Energy is on the y-axis. And that'll make more sense when we show you the, the formula breakdown. Frequency is on the x-axis always for the, this is for the photoelectric effect. Um, anytime you're uh, dealing with a graph of it. And the frequency is usually times 10 to the 14th. Make sure you catch that. These are pretty high frequencies. We're dealing with, um, typically you're dealing with mostly visible light, but then you get into, uh, it's pretty rare that infrared actually works. It's usually visible light to ultraviolet and then onward um, is the range where um, Robert Millikan was getting uh, evidence for the photoelectric effect. Um, so what happens really is you, and you might have a, you might see questions like this. Um, you would get, uh, you would be able to measure the amount of energy um, with respect to a certain frequency. Okay, so a certain frequency of light would produce a certain amount of, 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 uh, I guess kinetic energy, which you could analyze using. Um, the stopping voltage. And so you just uh, keep increasing the frequency and you mat and then you measure how much kinetic energy or how much energy there is. And ideally what will happen, I'll maybe sketch one here. You could get, you know, you, you may for a different metal, this is for one metal. I'll just, what you do is you'd get a bunch of data points that might kind of scatter along a straight line, something like this. Okay. And, um, because obviously you're not going to get any energy until you hit the threshold frequency. Now you may not hit it exactly, or you may not know exactly where it is, but what you do is you basically draw a line of best fit. Okay. And uh, in physics, we would, we would practice this with paper and a, and a, and a ruler. Um, there are ways you can do it on your graphing calculator, but the simple one is you bait and I'm totally sketching this here. This is not accurate at all, but you would basically, um, try and draw a line of best fit that would best go through your data points. Okay. And um, I'm kind of eyeballing this here. So it'd be something like that. Okay. So what I just drew there was a line of best fit that would have gone through my data. And um, when you do that on this specific graph, there's a number of things that you should know about it. And the first one is, as already indicated on the other one, where the um, your line crosses the x-axis right there. That is the threshold frequency or F0. And it's noted on the other one, right? F0. Um, the, uh, sorry, I'm just going to do that again. There. So uh, this is the frequency you have to hit before you'll get electrons coming off. Now, um, the other one, and I really had to come way down here to get mine, but... Um, the other one is the y-axis, okay? So where the where the graph hits the y-axis, yes, it's in the negative um, energy area, but that is equal to the work function, which is a capital W, as it says right there, work function, okay? That's the equivalent, the negative equivalent of the work function. And you can get both of those variables just from the graph. So there's some really helpful information um, from this graph. The biggest one being, though, the slope of this line, the slope of the line that we just drew is Planck's constant, okay? Just, it's the mathematical constant, and which is 6.63 times 10 to the negative uh, 34 joule seconds, or 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15 electron volt seconds. Um, worth noting are the units for this. So on the, the original graph, it was energy on the y-axis and frequency on the x. So what that means is your units would be joules per hertz. Okay, joules on the top, hertz on the bottom. But hertz though is really cycles per second. Okay, 
So if we look at that, okay, we have cycles per second in the denominator and we can reciprocate that and bring seconds up to the numerator and then we would have joule seconds per cycle. Okay, let me erase that. Joule seconds per cycle. And because it is just one cycle, we drop that uh, in the unit. So because it's just one. So then what we're left with are joule seconds. Okay. And that's exactly what the units are for Planck's constant, joule seconds. Now, easily enough, if we switch that with electron volts, you do, you'd have electron volts per hertz or electron volts um, per cycle per second, which that also reciprocates to electron volt seconds which is the other unit, okay? Now, as you can probably guess, uh, it doesn't matter which metal you analyze, each metal will have a different graph and you could analyze some theory questions similar to this picture here, okay? Because what's really interesting as Millikan collected his data, every metal as he plotted it had the same slope, okay? And obviously that's, um, you know, as soon as, as soon as you're plotting like data on a graph and you see a slope, that's, you're like, wow, I've got a constant here. There's a constant relationship. There's something that's the same about, about uh, what's producing this data. And lo and behold, that's it. Okay, so here you can see, um, you know, calcium is uh, 2.9 electron volts. That's the threshold frequency. So it's going to start releasing electrons before copper and before selenium. Selenium is the toughest, if you will, of these three metals, and it won't release any electrons until you hit um, 5.11. Uh, there's obviously no um, numbers on this x-axis, but if you can see that, see right there at that specific frequency, copper and calcium are already letting go of their electrons. They're like, they started doing that a while ago, and um, calcium would have released them with uh, quite high energy compared to copper at that point, but selenium is just barely starting, if that makes sense, okay? So um, something worth noting on the, uh, on the graphing side. So this is the summary um, of the graphing. And what we're really trying to do, this is similar to Coulomb's constant. We need to see if we can take the relationship and kind of massage it, is what I like to say, into the expression y equals mx plus b. Okay, so I've written it down over here, which I think is, makes it maybe a little more sense than what's written there. Um, for the photoelectric effect, the energy in has to equal the energy out. The uh, We have the photon hf is equal to the work function of the metal plus ek max. Because in our graph, ek max is the y value, okay? We're putting the energy on the y axis I need to make that in the y position, okay? So I just uh, I just solve this. I basically subtract ek max. Oh no, sorry, sorry. I'm not going to do that because I don't want negatives. I'm going to subtract the work function um, from the right hand side and do that from the left. And then, you know, the convention of course is to put your variable you're expressing on the left. So EK max will equal HF minus W. Okay. And here, and then it lines up, then it's just awesome. So from here, look, EK max lines up with the Y value. Okay. Which is exactly where it is or exactly what it's expressing. H, Planck's constant, lines up with M, which is the slope, okay? The rise over the run for the graph. The frequency uh, of the um, light being used lines up with the X value, okay? That's what's on the X value. Usually, again, it's times 10 to the 14th. And um, with the X intercept, of course, being that threshold frequency. And then B, if you remember from a straight line formula, B is the y-intercept, okay? And that y-intercept is the equivalent of the work function. So anyway, this one is awesome in terms of how easily it lines up with uh, the formula for a straight line. And there's the empowerment of finding Planck's constant from a graph, okay? Which you will need to do shortly. Now, 
I also added this. I I didn't get it on the first video. This is um, uh, perhaps maybe a slightly better summary that helps you separate intensity versus frequency. Those two terms are easy to get confused when you're making sense of this photoelectric effect. So what I want you to remember is what I've typed here. Um, in the photoelectric effect, one photon produces one electron. One photon will come in, 100% of that photon will disappear. Like all of that energy will go into the metal and to the ejected electron. So um, the photon doesn't exist anymore after it hits the metal, okay? Um, it's been, all that energy is absorbed by the metal and then eventually by the electron. But the ratio is one to one. For every photon, there is an electron produced or a photoelectron, okay? So step one there just emphasizes, hey, if the incoming photon has less energy than the work function, nothing's gonna happen. You could bombard that metal with, you know, thousands and thousands of light bulbs um, that are below the threshold frequency and nothing will happen. You can you could do that to eternity and nothing would happen, which is partially why the classical physics model was frustrating because under that model, it predicts that something should happen after a while, right? Because you should be you should be absorbing all these all these photons, so something should happen. It nothing happens. You must exceed the threshold frequency, and then uh, electrons start flying off. Okay, so again, that's what number two says. When the threshold frequency or the work function, whatever, is exceeded, then the electrons are ejected, and the and the current now in the um, the photoelectric effect setup, right? The the tube, the vacuum tube that's got the cathode and the anode, the current will no longer be zero. Now, at that point, if the frequency is increased, the frequency now, that means that the EK max per electron is also going to increase. But there won't be a change in the number of photons hitting the metal. So if you had just if you only increase the frequency, so you'd still have the same in you'd have the same intensity, so the same number of electrons hitting the metal, uh, or there would be the same number of 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 uh, photons, sorry, hitting the metal. Okay, so then there wouldn't be any it, there wouldn't be any change in the number of photoelectrons, and there'd be no change in current because you'd still have the same number of electrons coming out. They could be coming out faster, but they're only they're only flying fast in the tube. As soon as they slam into the cathode then they're kind of in line and they're making their way through the circuit to, you know, um, produce a current and everything. Okay. So you increase the frequency, you increase the EK max, um, but you, you basically do nothing to the current flow. But number four says, if you in, if intensity is increased at this point, that means more photons are hitting the metal, which means more photoelectrons or sorry, more photons. I, I keep tripping on that, sorry. More photons hitting the metal means there's more photoelectrons being ejected, which means there's going to be more current, okay? But what's, in, again, even with intensity, um, you'll have just more electrons will come out, or but they will um, have the same kinetic energy. So I hope that makes a little more sense. There'll be more review coming on that, um, but uh, we'll get ready for the next um, evidence that light is a particle. The photoelectric effect confirms that light is a particle.